Hi everyone, I'm Jack the Rambling Rack and Turn. I hope that you're doing well. I'd like to share a few thoughts about the poetry of Cesar Vallejo. Vallejo was a Peruvian poet writing in the early 20th century, and he's a really wonderful poet to spend time with, in large part because of the different poetic styles that he was writing in throughout his career. He began as a very avant-garde poet, deeply influenced by modernism. His sensibilities uh, feel very avant-garde. And he then shifts in a later mode to being much more personal, confessional even, in his poetry. The, the style changes, the subject matter changes. In a final phase of his career, he became uh, very overt political. His poetry took on polemic tones. Uh, he was very focused on the Spanish Civil War, very active uh, during that period before his untimely death in 1938 from an illness. And so what I'd like to do is sort of share examples of poetry from each of those phases, talk a little bit about them, and then share at the end some works that uh, I feel are connected, whether they were influences on Vallejo, uh, contemporaries of Vallejo, or just have some other type of connection. So we begin with his avant-garde poetry. He uh, was born in Peru, and the modernism he was drawn to was not just the literary modernist movements that were popular in Europe or in North America, but the particular and explicit influence of Ruben Darío, the great Nicaraguan poet. And so this is a poem, Huaco, from uh, uh, Vallejo's early works. I am the blind Coraquenque that sees through the lens of a wound and is attached to the globe as if to a magnificent revolving Huaco. I am the llama that nothing touches but the hostile mindlessness of shearing off clarion curls, clarion curls gleaming with revulsion and bronzed by a melancholy Yaravi. I am the young condor whose feathers were lost to a Latin harquebus, and on the fringe of humanity I float in the Andes like a perennial Lazarus of night of light. I am Inca grace eroding in golden coricanches, baptized with phosphates of error and hemlock. Sometimes among my stones suddenly prance the shattered nerves of an extinct puma, a ferment of sun, leavening of shadow and heart. And that feels very avant-garde. Uh, the way he is drawing on his on his proving heritage, the explicit references he gives um, are, are just all fantastic. And the way that he constantly is shifting his perspective, what does he feel, how does he feel connected? And what is the way in which that connection allows him to experience life, but more explicitly to experience sort of pain, disappointment, loss. Um, so it, it's a very powerful early poem. I think that shows sort of where his interests are and what his roots are. In a poem that explicitly references Dario, uh, Retablo or Retable, I say to myself, at last I am escaping the noise. No one sees that I'm going to the sacred nave. Tall shadows gather, and Dario goes by with his morning draped lyre. With countless steps, the sweet muse emerges, and my eyes rush to her, like chicks to grain. Ether rushes, and drowsing titmice pursue her. Meanwhile, the blackbird dreams of life in her hand. My God, you are merciful because you bestowed the knave where these blue sorcerers perform their rites. Dario of the celestial Americas, how much they resemble you. And from your locks, they fashion their hair shirts like wraiths seeking burial plots of absurd gold. Those vagrant arch priests of the heart drop out of sight, appear and speaking from afar, weep to us of the monotonous suicide of God. And that, that again feels deeply modern. He, he's, of course, referencing Dario. He's talking uh, in that final stanza with fascinating language, like race seeking burial plots of absurd gold and referencing the idea that, that you know, so much of violence and horror and, uh, had occurred in this quest for gold in the American continents um, and, and this way that he links his own poetic quests uh, in that way. He notes those vagrant arch priests of the heart drop out of sight, appear and speaking from afar weep to us. And th this idea that they're, you know, who are these vagrant archpriests? Is it more important that they're vagrant or is it more important that they're archpriests? The way that he allows these juxtapositions, these questions to exist in his poetry, is, I think really quite fascinating. And then there at the end, we see his uh, spiritual sensibilities starting to dry out. He's quite explicit um, in different ways about the, the, the religious beliefs he has or has lost or has perhaps rediscovered uh, throughout his different uh, the different phases of his life. The f a subsequent poem, Pagan Women, pagan woman, to go dying and singing and to baptize the shadow with the Babylonian blood of a noble gladiator and to swirl the cuneiforms of the golden carpet with the feather of a nightingale and blue ink of grief. Life, protean woman, to watch a frightened, unfaithful, unfaithful, false Judith escape in her veils, to see her from the wound and capture her in my gaze, encrusting a caprice of wax onto a ruby. Must of Babylonia, unfermented, hull of furnace without troops. In the Christian tree I have hung my nest. The redemptive vine refused love to my goblets. Judith, duplicitous life, lay down her sacrificial body. Like a pagan feast, and to love her even in death, 
while her veins sow red pearls of evil and thus return to dust a hapless conqueror, leaving thousands of eyes of blood on the dagger. Uh, and again, the, the different um, sort of points of view that he notes within the poetry, the one in which he has this eye, that, that, this sense that he's seeing, uh, he's seeing someone from a wound, that, that some, his sight is somehow existing through a wound that has been made um, in the famous killing of Holofernes by Judith. Uh, the way that he uh, reflects on this, I have hung my nest in a Christian tree, like he's a bird. He, he's not only looking from a wound in one sense, in a subsequent stanza, he has this sense of, you know, he, he's built his nest somewhere, so he's a bird, and the idea of the bird's eye view of what's going on. And then to note it at the end, leaving thousands of eyes of blood on the dagger, that each one of those could be a point of view uh, on what has transpired. is really quite interesting. It's quite fascinating. And I think it reveals um, the, the ways in which... Uh, you know, uh, Vallejo was a very avant-garde poet, was a very, you know, modernist poet in, in, in capital M modernism. And that might be a poetic style people are really interested in. Now, later in life, he would shift over. He would uh, move from Peru into Europe. He would spend much of his adult life working as a journalist, as a reporter, writing not just for papers there in Europe, but even for newspapers that were back in Lima in Peru. And we start to see in his poetry a shift that culminates in Trilce, which are deeply, as I said, po uh, romantic poems. They're much more personal, much more confessional, which would, you know, a style that would become popular, a, a descriptor for a style that would become more common in the 20th century in the U.S. Uh, but he seems to prefigure some of that. And some of his early poems point in that direction that he would move toward. Amor, you no longer come to my dead eyes, and how my idealist heart weeps for you. My chalices all are open, awaiting your autumnal hosts and auroral wines. Amor, divine cross, irrigate my deserts with your astral blood that dreams and weeps. Amor, you no longer come to my dead eyes that both fear and long for your dawn lament. Amor, I don't love you when you are far away, raffled off like a merry painted bacante, or a fragile woman with a turned up nose. Amor, come without flesh as Olympian ichor so that I, in the manner of God, may be a man who loves and begets without sensual pleasure." Now, there we have, again, he's pointing his, the, the, the arrow towards the idea that he's going to ultimately write poetry that is, frankly, more romantic. But here we see a, a poem that is looking at romance through a very modernist lens still. Uh, he is, you know, he's parodying the concept of the incarnation and the, you know, the Immaculate Conception there at the, the end. He's noting ideas around Olympian ichor, uh, the idea that he's, uh, irrigate my deserts with your astral blood that dreams and weeps. The stars are somehow going to weep and, and that the rain somehow is this um, almost divine liquid that's falling down and, and, and harkening back to very classical ideas around what was rain, you know, what, the, the ambrosia and nectar of the gods in some sense from Homer. And so we see those different styles uh, and he moves towards ideas that, that are um, more and less provocative because he's going to, the, the political sensibilities that were the flower of his late poetry are present there at the beginning in a poem like Unity. In this dark night, my clock is panting beside my shadowed temple like the apple of a revolver that spins, though the trigger doesn't find the bullet. The white, still, moist-eyed moon is an aimed eye, and I sense how the great mystery is minted in a hostile, ovo ovoid idea in a bullet bright red. Ah, hand that limits, that threatens behind every door, and that breathes in all the clocks, yield and go on by. Above the gray spider of your skeleton, another great hand of light holds a bullet, shaped like a heart of blue. The imagery that uh, I've shared in these early poems from Viejo uh, is very startling at times. It's very specific. It's often very concrete. It brings to mind certain movements like the surrealism of uh, Salvador Dali, and the way that here we have bullets that are shaped like hearts. Uh, and, and the colors that are associated with him, that, that he really is almost describing a painting in some ways. Uh, he, he's articulating, you know, his dreams in poetry the same way that the Surrealists might articulate their dreams through paintings and images. And so that first movement is really quite fascinating. His second movement of poetry, where he, he is explicitly now writing the poems that form Trilce that are of a more confessional nature, is uh, less obscure and gnomic. In its imagery, it's much less obscure in terms of the language. It uh, feels closer to some of the poetry perhaps created by Hart Crane. Uh, certainly later poets in the 20th century would become much more autobiographical in their poetry. So this is an example of one of those uh, poems. It's ended. The stranger with whom, late in the night, you came home talking, talking. Now there won't be anyone waiting for me. My place ready, the bad good, 
It's ended the warm afternoon, your large har harbor and your whale. Ended the chatting with your mother, who fixed us tea brimming with afternoon. It's ended, it's finally over, the holidays, your obedient breasts, your way of asking me not to go. And it's ended the diminutive, because of my being of age and the grief without end, and our having been born for no reason. And so there we see uh, the language is much more mundane. He's referencing, you know, everyday experiences, tea, uh, you know, harbors, th th objects that feel very concrete, very um, typical and, and quotidian. And yet the sensibilities of Vallejo still break through, even in these poems that feel a little more, you know, less avant-garde or more normal. Uh, the way that he, he notes uh, there at the end, it's ended the diminutive because of my being of age and the grief without end and our having been born for no reason. That he's getting at this very dark existential question there on the very final line. Um, and the idea that po poetry often culminates sort of in not just the images we get, but in some powerful final line many times, that that's important, that Vallejo is doing that on purpose, that he's asking those questions even in these poems. And another, he goes, the meeting with the beloved wants so much as a simple detail, nearly a horse track program in violet, so long it cannot easily be folded. Lunch with her who would be setting out the dish we liked yesterday, and it was repeated now, but with a little more mustard, the fork in a trance, her radiant quality of a pistol in May, and her bought on the cheap modesty, for no reason at all, at all. and the lyric in nervous beer, watched closely by breasts, untouched by hops, and that you mustn't drink too much. And he goes on to describe this sort of event, you know, just at a cafe or at a restaurant or at a bar. Um, and so Trilce is a very, as I said, a very different poetic mode. It's something that is not particularly avant-garde. There are the, the same philosophies, many of the same sensibilities are present from his earlier experimental poems, uh, but, but the, the style feels closer to what we see across 20th century poetry. And then later on, he would start to uh, begin um, sort of to go in two divergent directions through a, a series of poems that he wrote that were not published until after his death in 1938. So the poemas uh, humanos have poems that are much more sort of romantic, lyrical poems that, that feel again normal. Uh, and then poems that are like explicit pro, uh, prose poems deep influenced by perhaps Walt Whitman or other writers who have uh, these longer you know, poems that, that do tell a story or that give this series of fragmented images that are linked in some way. So this is a good example of one of those. Possibly I am someone else walking at dawn, someone marching around a large disc, a malleable disc, fatal, figurative, audacious diaphragm. Possibly I think back as I wait, I take note of marbles where scarlet sundial and where bronze cut and absent spurious, truly furious box. Possibly finally a man Shoulders anointed with merciful indigo. Possibly, I tell myself, there is nothing beyond. The disc gives me the sea, referring it with a certain dry margin to my throat. Nothing in truth, more acid, more sweet, more Kantian. But another's sweat, but serum, or a storm of meekness, sinking or rising, that never. Reclining, refined, I exhume myself. Tumescent, the mixture I beat my way into. Without legs, without mature clay, without arms, a needle pinned in the great atom. No, never. Never yesterday, never later. And then this satanic tubercle, this pleosaurian moral molar, and these posthumous suspicions, this sundial, this gray hair, these tickets. And that's written towards the end of his life, and again, sort of harks back to the experimental style he had early on. He, after he had, you know, spent years writing in both styles, he then, in the final years of his life, would just alternate between them. He was very comfortable writing in both styles. And we see there's some interesting ideas. The um, shoulders anointed with merciful indigo, and the, the significance of that, the way that, um, well, you know, what does that mean for, uh, for Vallejo? What does that mean for his audience? Again, this is a poem that he never chose to publish during his lifetime, but felt was important enough to keep and sort of compile. The way possibly I am someone else walking at dawn, someone marching around a large disc, a malleable disc. The idea that he then references malleability later on, where he refers to himself um, in the way that he's beating himself into a mixture without legs, without mature clay, without arms, but a needle pinned in the great atom, the idea of uh, the, the significance of a needle, you know, pinned in, in a figurine to create pain somewhere else. But also the idea that um, at this point, we're, we're now aware of concepts like atoms. That's something he can write about in his poetry in interesting ways. And then the final stanza after that, no, never, you know, never now, never later, uh, and he shouts this, he goes, then this, sat then this satanic tubercle, this pleosaurian moral molar, uh, the, uh, this idea around fossils and gigantic ideas, posthumous suspicions, 
uh, and how he links all of that together is really quite strange and um, beautiful in a, in, a, in a very specific way. But finally, uh, Vallejo, who had always been politically active, he had always had those existential questions, those questions around purpose, around life. He became very explicitly political in his final um, years. He was very active in the Spanish Civil War. He was uh, not just reporting on it and writing about it, but he was even writing sort of poems about the conflict, uh, about men who had died, about different battles. And he has the famous poem that gives this title its collection. Spain, take this chalice from me. Children of the world, if Spain falls, I mean, you hear that said, if her arm, her forearm falls from the heavens, caught in a halter led between two terrestrial plates. Children, how old the age of sunken temples, how early in the sun was what I, what I was telling you, how soon in your breast the ancient noise, how old you're too in the notebook. Children of the world, mother Spain is here with the burden of her womb. Our teacher is here with her ferals. Mother and teacher is here. Cross and wood, for she gave you height, vertigo, and division, and sums, children, she is with herself, judgment fathers. If she falls, I mean, you hear that said, if Spain falls down from the earth, children, how will you stop growing? How the year will chastise the month, how your teeth will stay at ten, the diphthong on block letters, the metal in tears, how the young lamb will still be tied by the foot to the large inkwell, how you will descend the steps of the alphabet to the letter that gave birth to pain. Children, sons of warriors, in the meantime, speak softly, for at this very moment Spain is distributing energy among the animal kingdom, the flowers, the comets, and man. Speak softly, for she is here, in all her rigor which is great, not knowing what to do, and in her hand is the skull, speaking, it speaks, and speaks. The skull, the one with the braid, the skull, the one from life. Speak softly, I say to you, speak softly, the song of syllables, the sobbing of matter and the lesser murmur of the pyramids and even that of your temples walking with two stones breathe softly and if a forearm falls if ferals clatter if it is night if the sky can be held within two terrestrial limbs if there is noise in the sound of doors if i am late if you see no one if you are frightened by pencils with dull points if mother spain falls i mean you hear that said go forth children of the world go out to seek her uh, and he has this this command in these poems he is not he has written war poems he's written you know songs of liberation he's written protest songs revolutionary songs and yet here he has this clarion call uh that feels as as close to some of the anti-war poetry from world war one that feels very drawn towards um you know that this this crusade in a sense that he is calling others to uh and and it's fascinating to see how um, writers artists intellectuals tried to grapple with what happened during the Spanish Civil War, the, um, the violence that existed, the way that so many different movements uh, seemed to come to this you know, crest, and then the betrayals that ensued, the, um, the horrors that came afterwards that Vallejo did not live to see uh, are, are, are present, of course, in our minds as we read his poems. Um, and so that, that final phase of his poetry is very interesting. It, it, feels avant-garde and modernist in some of its imagery, but the sensibility is very different now. He's very much a man of action. He's a poet of action uh, who, who wants others to join with him in this movement. And so that's Cesar Vallejo as a poet. I, as I said, I think he's a critical poet from the 20th century, and there are various connections that can be made. I think very explicitly, the first one is, of course, um, the poetry of Ruben Dario. You can find, there is a, a thick book of his poetry and writings, uh, but he's also collected in various works like the Penguin Book of Spanish Verse. A contemporary poet to Vallejo, who was went through a number of different styles himself, would have been Federico Garcia Yorca, uh, one of my favorite poets, certainly, and someone who uh, was murdered during the Spanish Civil War. Uh, Garcia Yorca had his poems that were sort of ballads. He had poems that were more experimental, talking about his life in New York, uh, or a, a poet in New York, where he, he you know, uh, the poems that are more romantic and that talk about, uh, you know, what... The, the different ways he finds zest in life. So he's someone who I think is very critical. I had mentioned, I think there are some ways in which Walt Whitman pretty explicitly influenced uh, Vallejo. Um, another contemporary poet, but someone who went in a very different direction would have been Pablo Neruda. Um, Neruda was, again, very explicitly political in a number of his poems, uh, but he would also write his, his, his love songs, 20 Love Poems and a Song of Despair was sort of the, the very famous work that launched him in many ways, and um, not just in South America, but certainly in Spain, where this appeared 
Now, I will say this. I think that Vallejo's uh, sensibilities are, in some ways, his avant-garde poetry recalls the stories of Jorge Luis Borges. I think it's much stronger than the poetry of Jorge Luis Borges. But there are some startling and interesting images, uh, certainly, on display in those poems. The different styles don't quite draw on the different voices that Fernando uh, Pessoa would create in his poetry. Um, but there are different links. I think particularly some of the shanty songs that Pessoa wrote uh, feel close to some of the poetry um, towards the end uh, that Vallejo was composing. The revolutionary nature in uh, the final phase of Vallejo's uh, poetry is very close to some of the poems in the Penguin Book of uh, Modern African Poetry, uh, particularly poets from Angola, from uh, from nations that were struggling and, and struggling for their independence uh, and ending the colonialism from Europe. The early poems and the very strange images, the, the energy, the vitality in these, um, particularly in poems like Amores, recall the poetry of Frank Stanford, another poet who died young, a, a poet who was not really so much part of the confessional poetry movement in the US, but was blazing his own path, his own direction. Writers who were writing sort of around that time period in Spain, uh, we have Juan Sales who wrote in Catalan, uh, and I think Uncertain Glory Remains probably my single favorite novel of the Spanish Civil War. Uh, a more recent publication would have been the translation uh, from the Galician of uh, The Last Days of Terranova by Manuel Rivas. Joseph Pla's Grey Notebook was uh, collected during the, um, the late 1918, 1919, flu epidemic. Uh, and these are, you know, just a collection of sort of re memories, re daily reflections uh, by Joseph Pla, written while he was living in Barcelona. Another proving writer who sort of um, pushed at a number of different ideas very effectively would have been the great Mario Vargas Llosa in Conversation uh, in, in the Cathedral. I think this is the one that feels closest to what uh, Vallejo is accomplishing. And the way that Eduardo Galeano is not only a great political activist, but also a great writer, and the way that he draws on the past and he draws on images to create the trap tapestry that is mem memory of fire, um, just felt very present in my mind as I was reading Vallejo's poetry. So let me know if you have favorite poems by Vallejo, if there are other South American poets or Central American poets that you love, and I hope everybody's having a great one. Thank you. <laughs>